Good afternoon. Our lecture for this afternoon would be on healthcare systems, economics, and financing. If I were to ask you to list the top five countries of which you think has the best health system, the results might surprise you. Based on the WHO, based on attainment of goals, health expenditure per capita, and performance, the top five health systems would be Malta, Andorra, San Marino, Italy, and France. Other countries that we may have thought of first would rank 10, 144, 60, 37 respectively. For India, because of the per capita, it would rank almost the same as China. Why France? France a combined private and public health coverage. Most citizens receive their insurance through their employer and almost everyone has supplemental private insurance. The majority of medical bills are paid for by the government and the remainder is footed by individuals supplemental private insurance. So this is spending of France wherein 75% would be coming from the National Health Insurance Program. It's ranked first because the supply of providers is very available. There's high degree of freedom for physicians and patients. There are few restrictions in the range of services covered by the health insurance system. There's easy access, there's an absence of waiting list, and there is patient satisfaction. So learning outcomes for this lecture would be to describe the key elements of a health system, define common terms in health economics, analyze Philippine healthcare system and financing situation, and compare the advantages and disadvantages of the different forms of health financing. So your WHO states that there are key components of a well-functioning health system, and this improves the health status of individuals, families, and communities. It defends the population against what threatens its health. For our times, it's the coronavirus pandemic. Protecting people against the financial consequences of ill health, providing equitable access to people-centered care, and making it possible for people to participate in decisions affecting their health and health system. Of course, any health system would have challenges. This was seen in the recent virus pandemic. You would see that even Italy, who was ranked top five health system in the world crumbled against the disease called coronavirus. Challenges pre-pandemic would be disproportionate focus on specialist curative care, the fragmentation in competing programs, projects, and institutions of governments or NGOs, and the pervasive commercialization of healthcare delivery in poorly regulated systems, thereby brand names are perceived to be much better than their generic counterparts. To keep the health system on track, it has to have a strong sense of direction. We have to have coherent investment in the various building blocks of the health system so that we could provide the kind of services that produce results. So these are the different elements of a well-functioning healthcare system. Leadership and governance, health information system, health financing, human resources for health, essential medical products and technologies, and service delivery, which we will tackle one by one. So leadership and governance ensures that health authorities has the responsibility for steering the entire health sector dealing with future challenges and current problems. We define policies, strategy, and plan that set a clear direction for the health sector. So we define policies, strategy, and plan that set a clear direction for the health sector, such as health equity, public 
health policies, governance, so that we foresee implications to financing, human resources, pharmaceuticals, technology, and infrastructure. Mechanisms for accountability and adaptation should be put into place. Regulation, policy dialogue with other sectors, and arrangements to channel donor funding and align priorities. So this is only possible if you have a good health information system. So this health information system could meet health challenges and objectives through household surveys, civil registration, and epidemiological surveillance. So health financing, trends and needs for human resources for health, use of pharmaceuticals, cost of technology, distribution of infrastructure so that access to care and the quality of the services provided would be available to all. Included also would be monitoring and evaluation plan that specifies core indicators, data collection and management, analysis and communication use. These arrangements to make information accessible to all involved, including communities, civil society, health professionals, and politicians. Of course, important would be our human resource for health, and this is essential to achieving health for all, such that a well-performing workforce is one that is responsive to the needs and expectations of people, fair and efficient to achieve best outcomes possible given available resources and circumstances. So sufficient numbers and the right mix, payment systems for the health resource, regulatory mechanisms to ensure system-wide deployment and distribution in accordance with needs, and establishment of job-related norms, deployment of support systems, and an indeed work environments. Ensure cooperation of all stakeholders involved. Also, we have essential medical products and technologies. So this is universal access to healthcare that is heavily dependent on access to affordable essential medicines, vaccines, diagnostics, and health technologies of assured quality, which are used in a scientifically sound and cost-effective way. So economically, medical products are the second largest component of most of our health budgets and the largest component of private health expenditure in low and middle income countries. So we have to have a medical products regulatory system so that we could authorize, monitor, and support through legislation, enforcement, and inspection of medical products and their quality. There's a national list of essential medical products. This is to standardize levels of care to guide procurement and reimbursement and training and ensure an equitable and just supply and distribution system with focus on the poor and disadvantage. Of course, we have to monitor price and availability. We have to also promote rational prescribing. Okay. So they are effective as they provide services. So networks of close to client primary care organized as health districts or local area networks with the backup of specialized and hospital services responsible for defined populations. The provision of a package of benefits with a comprehensive and integrated range of clinical and public health interventions that respond to the full range of health problems of their populations, including those targeted by the Millennium Development Goals and eventually the SDGs. Standards, norms, and guidance to ensure access and essential dimensions of quality, safety, effectiveness, integration, continuity, and people-centeredness. Mechanisms to hold providers accountable for access and quality and to ensure consumer voice. 
So this would be how our LJU would look at health systems delivery. And it is a scorecard as basis performance. And these are the targets for the different categories of the scorecards provided in the prior slide. So focus on the, focusing on the economics, your definition of terms, you have to be familiar with your GNP and your GDP. So it's gross national product and gross domestic product. So this would indicate the sum total of three components in a country, namely personal consumption, expenditure on goods and services, and investment expenditure. Definitions, GDP is an estimated value of the total worth of a country's production services calculated over the course of one year. So it is consumption plus government expenditures plus investment plus exports minus imports. Gross national product would be the total amount of goods and services that the country's citizens produce regardless of where they produce them. So how... GDP is calculated by adding up the market value of all expenditures on final output. So consumption is the amount consumed by their private domestic residents. Investment is the amount put aside by private firms to build new plant and equipment for future production. Government purchases would be the amount used by the government. And current account balance would be the amount of net exports of goods and services to foreigners. Per capita is an important concept because it is determined by the number of people. This is why China or India would not be considered as a good health system primarily because of a large population. So to find the per capita cost, the total number of persons are added up and the bill tax or benefits are divided equally among those persons. So per capita, you would see that Luxembourg, Norway, these are European countries with a good GDP because of the number of population. So devaluation, depreciation, and inflation is the lowering of the value of a country's currency's fixed exchange rate system. This is an unofficial decrease in the exchange rate in a floating exchange rate system. So this erodes the purchasing power of money. So for example, what a 1,000 peso bill today cannot buy, cannot buy the same amount of things that a 1,000 peso bill pre-pandemic could buy. So health economics can be broadly defined as the application of theories, concepts, and techniques of economics to the healthcare sector. So allocation of resources, determining quantity of resources used in healthcare delivery, organization and funding of health organizations, efficiency of the allocation and use of resources for health, assessing the effects of preventive, curative, rehabilitative health services, and it's a vicious cycle. If you are not healthy, you will not be part of the workforce. Would have economic decline, low income, low access to food and water, hunger, which would again bring about disease and inability to be productive members of society. Thereby, it is important to remember that a healthy population would generally lead to a better economy. For the Philippines, GDP would rank on the lowest among countries that we haven't even heard of. And health budget would just be a mere 1.4% and spending would be like so. However, this would not be the case since there is a pandemic going on now. Every budget has been rechanneled to the Department of Health. And you will see how 
important health is in a country when you see how your budget gives uh, its allocation to the health sector. In the Philippines, total health expenditure is 5,362 per Filipino. And 56.3 of that would be out of pocket. So this is the health expenditure depending on the source of funds. So your health economics determines the price and the quantity of limited financial and non-financial resources devoted to the care of the sick and promotion of health. So there is cost of disease, benefits of health programs, returns from investment in medical education, training, and research. Main aim would be the quantity over time the resources used in health service delivery. So this is to organize, allocate, and manage health resources in such a way that they are used for health services with maximum efficiency. So it could be either preventive, curative, or rehabilitative. So this is to achieve maximal individual and national productivity. So remember, health citizenry is a productive citizenry. So that is important, how important health is. So we have to minimize cost or we have to look at cost benefit, cost effectiveness, and cost utility. So cost minimization is the lowest opportunity cost for a given activity. Cost benefit would be estimating all costs and possible benefits derived from the invested resource. Cost effectiveness would be the comparison of costs and health effects of an intervention to assess the extent to which it can be regarded as providing value for money. Cost utility is to determine cost in terms of utilities, especially quantity and quality of life. This is difficult to put value on the health status as perceived by different individuals. So you have your Average cost effectiveness ratio. This is your health care costs over clinical outcome. This represents the total cost of a program or treatment alternative divided by its clinical outcome to yield a ratio representing the cost per specific clinical outcome gain independent of comparators. Your ICER is your incremental cost effective ratio. So cost A minus cost B over effect A minus effect B. So this is the additional cost that a treatment alternative imposes over another treatment is compared with the additional effect, benefit, or outcome it provides. So for example, your average cost effectiveness ratio drug A would be $165 per 56. So that is 294.64 per treatment. For drug B, you would have 212.96 per treatment success. So computing it, so for drug B, there's $30 per additional treatment compared to drug A. But again, the value is not always dictated by monetary measurements. Okay. So health needs are infinite, whereas the resources are definitely limited. We have seen this with the initial phase of the pandemic, where face masks were priced at 1,500 pesos compared to its original price of 50 pesos per box. This is how scarcity is explained. So welfare governments try to ensure that economic thinking is built more closely in the planning and decision-making process, keeping the cardinal concept 
in scarcity in view. So your government has to have put policies in place to avoid those things. So what they did was put a price cap on these essential goods. Again, um, we will see later in our lecture problem prioritization. We need prioritization because our resources are limited. Of course, the demand for masks increased because of your pandemic. So this refers to the type, quantity, and quality of services or commodities wanted or requested. So the demand is a function of consumer's income, the price of medical care related to the prices, and tastes and preferences of consumers, including their perceptions about health and health care. Cool. So we have a poverty line and refers to the cut-off point of income below which people are not able to purchase food sufficient to provide 2,400 kilocals per day. So generally defined in terms of minimum per capita consumption level of the people. So if you would see, you would have to have 5,590 per month to meet your basic food needs and 8,000 per month to meet your basic food and non-food needs. But look at the take-home pay of an average minimum wage earner. It's 9,801.75. So there would be no room for other expenses or savings. And you will see that in India, poverty threshold would be as such with most of the poverty centralized in your rural areas. Okay. There is also a food and, po and poverty threshold. So food threshold is the minimum income required to meet basic food needs and satisfy the nutritional requirements set by the Food and Nutrition Research Institute to ensure that one remains economically and social productive. Poverty is expanded to include basic non-food needs such as clothing, housing, transportation, health, and education expenses. So one has to have a budget, and this is an economic plan for a specific period of time. So it means ensuring that program decisions become budget decisions. So this involves designating the spending authority for delivering the health program and ensuring that the budget is spent judiciously for various aspects of the program. So you have to have your allocations in place. So distribute resources, both monetary and non-monetary sense within a program. And again, you will see how priority is placed on the Department of Health compared to your other sectors. So health financing raises resources to pay for goods and services related to health. So sources of healthcare fund financing would be public sources, private sources, external cooperation or aid, individual or household, and mixed sources. So major problems in health financing would be lack of funds, unequal distribution of health finances, rising health costs, lack of coordination in health financing units, and wastage and inefficiency in spending the funds and resources. So for health financing, it's mostly out of pocket. So an individual pays a health provider or facility from his pocket each time he avails of medical services. Advantages of this, the individual spends money only when he avails and does not spend anything if not. This advantage is that individual develops problems in securing money or suffer from financial distress when you are critically sick. There's an insurance where an individual pays a premium which will cover hospital expenses up to a certain limit for a period of one year. Advantage, the individual pays a relatively small amount of money which will assure him of a big hospitalization coverage for a year. 
This advantage would be the individual who does not get seriously sick requiring hospitalization within the coverage period is not able to utilize services. So there are counts that say that just to use the insurance, they will go to the emergency room or OPD and consult for just about anything. So there are risks. So there's a risk of the individual so not be able to use the coverage within the period. There's no fund on the premiums. Risk of the insurance company would be overutilization of coverage, hazards, and increases in the prices of hospital and surgical care. So this happens during the pandemic because of the increased cost of your personal protective equipment as an addition to healthcare. So what happened was that the HMO or the health insurance issued a memo that it does not cover costs of PPE. So it should be shouldered by the doctor instead of the HMO. But again, again, what happens, it gets passed on to the consumer. So this is your HMO. The, community, the consumer pays a premium which will give him a comprehensive healthcare program through a package of benefits. So this is not merely hospital coverage, but a complete preventive, curative, and rehabilitative package. However, some policies, for example, would prevent this from being preventive. For example, a simple procedure such as pap smear would be screening for cervical cancer is often denied by your HMO. And this would be the usual HMO package of benefits, your annual PE, OPD, preventive health care, inpatient coverage, etc. So your effectiveness in resource allocation and utilization is important. So government spending is skewed towards hospital care and very few would uh, budget would uh, would reach the preventive stage. You know that cost effective preventive and public health programs often are underfunded. So offshore referral costs are excessively high, and provider induced demand for profitable goods and health services are there to increase revenue. In summary, these are the issues. So the, it, it, there's insufficient public spending on health, reductions in public financing, including external support, increased out-of-pocket pay through formal and informal fees, absence of financial protection, particularly for the poor, low efficiency in allocation and utilization of resources, and lack of reliable, reliable data and information. So these are the problems with the present health systems. While quality of healthcare is wanting in most areas, costs continue to rise, putting appropriate care beyond the reach of ordinary people. We still focus on curative care facilities and the effectiveness of the decentralized primary healthcare delivery system has been compromised because of the lack of coordination and cooperation among the LGU. So the ability of government to effectively regulate the quality and health services and health products remains weak, while resources for health remains inadequate, the funding that is available is inefficiently generated and inequitably spent. So we aim to reform the health sector this describes the major strategies, organizational, and policy changes needed to improve the way healthcare is delivered, regulated, and financed. Ultimately, this improves the health status of the people so that greater and more effective coverage of national and local public health programs increase access to health services, especially by the poor, and reduce financial burden on individual families. So focus would be financial risk protection, improve access to quality hospitals and health services, improve the safety and quality, 
access and availability and rational use of medicines, and ensure accountability and health system support. Guaranteeing adequate supply and equitable distribution of human resources for health. So this would be an NHIP of the Philippines. So this is done through a Republic Act 7875. Okay. So this is how our PhilHealth works. So you will uh, please do compare it with your Indian National Health Program. So it's mandated by law to give national health to all. So universality, of course, all citizens will be provided for equity and responsiveness okay so these are the objectives provide all citizens with access to health services so these would be the means to help the people pay for healthcare services and prioritize this to people who cannot afford services okay so one provider should be accredited so there are benefit packages and have certain coverage so these are leg legal dependents of a member, so a spouse who is not a member, unmarried children under 21, children who are 21 or above but suffering from disability, parents 60 years old or above, not otherwise a PhilHealth member. So a provider should be duly licensed as well. So this is a healthcare professional, any doctor of medicine registered in the Philippines. Okay. So there are three types of membership, indigent, individually paying, and a non-paying member. Okay. Benefits would be inpatient hospital care, room and board, services of healthcare professionals, Diagnostic, laboratory, and other medical exams, surgical and medical equipment, drugs, inpatient education packages. So these are the services available, outpatient, chemo, hemodialysis, radiotherapy, cataract, minor procedures performed in an operating room complex. So these are what's covered, drugs and medicines, laboratory, professional fees, operating room. So outpatient, consultation, lab fees, preventive and promotive health services. Okay, thank you for listening to this lecture. Please do subscribe to our channel for more lectures on preventive medicine and community health. Thank you.